Uh, good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of 2015. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones uh, and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting sub system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in a digital format. Um, agenda item one is a uh, decision whether to consider two items in private at this morning's meeting. Item three is a discussion about the evidence taken as part of our scrutiny of the draft budget 2016-17. And item four relates to our future work programme. Are members agreed that we take these items in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item two uh, is our substantive item for today. It's evidence in the draft budget 2016-17. Uh, the committee has been focus focusing its budget scrutiny and issues around investment of local government pension funds and capital infrastructure projects and also city deals and the opportunities for investment. Uh, today's uh, evidence session will also extend beyond these areas to other local government finance matters. I welcome John Swinney, MSP, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy. Stephen Gallagher, Deputy Director, Directorate for Local Government and Communities uh, and Head of Local Government and Analytical Services Division. And Bill Stitt, Assistant Team Leader, Local Government Finance and Local Taxation Unit. Uh, Mr Swinney, do you wish to make a, an opening statement, please? I will, Convener. I welcome the opportunity to meet with the Commission this morning and to address um, the issues in connection with the forthcoming Scottish Government budget. Um, in your own introductory remarks, Convener, you mentioned the fact that the committee is uh, focused on issues in relation to the utilisation of local authority pension funds in Scotland's infrastructure and the Scottish Government is keen to encourage greater investment by pension funds in Scotland's infrastructure. In June of this year, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Community uh, Communities and Pension Rights, welcomed the decision by Falkirk Local Government Pension Scheme to do just that by investing £30 million in affordable housing. Ministers have already asked the newly formed Local Government Pension Scheme Advisory Board to look at this question. The Scottish Government expects the Scheme Advisory Board's work to help uh, influence and create the conditions for spreading innovative practice so that more opportunities for funds to invest in infrastructure may be developed. Scottish Government officials are also committed to changing scheme regulations to ensure that they are not a barrier to Local Government Pension Scheme investment in infrastructure and are working with the Scheme Advisory Board to achieve this. However, a careful balance needs to be struck between encouraging this approach uh, and paying due regard to the responsibility of scheme managers to invest pension fund monies in accordance with the scheme manager's fiduciary duty. Our role is to work with our partners in local government to remove any barriers within our control and to identify any opportunities to optimise such investment, always respecting the fiduciary duties of the scheme managers. This discussion of pension scheme investment takes place in a wider context, within, which includes activities centred around the cities and a major programme of infrastructure investment. Cities and the re their regions are the engines of our economy. The Scottish Government is committed to working with all of our cities to unlock investment, whether that is individually or collectively, and whether, or whether that is through a city deal, uh, one of the Scottish Government's devolved initiatives to stimulate growth and deliver infrastructure investment, or a combination of all or some of these measures. Through the Scottish Cities Alliance, we are exploring opportunities for all of Scotland's cities. Opportunities arise within the context of a long-term plan, the Scottish Government's Infrastructure Investment Plan, which was published on the 6th of December 2011, sets out priorities for investment and long-term strategy for the development of public infrastructure, the plan sets out why we invest, how we invest and what we will invest in from now until 2030. It also provides certainty and transparency to the construction industry by outlining a clear pipeline of major projects. We will be publishing an updated infrastructure investment plan later this year. In conclusion, Scottish Ministers are committed to ensuring that local government pension scheme delivers appropriate returns for its scheme members, whilst also recognising the potential for those funds to be invested in Scotland's infrastructure. Uh, we look forward to the committee's deliberations on these issues and will take these into account as we seek to remove barriers uh, and optimise opportunities for such investment. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Swinney. During uh, the course uh, of our deliberations on this issue, a number of us went to uh, Manchester, uh, where we heard uh, about the cuts to local government there, which are um, far more substantial than we've had to um, face here in Scotland. 
uh, and we heard about the innovative ways that they were managing to fund investment, um, including um, new housing through uh, Matrix Homes, a, a company that's been established uh, to deal with pension fund investment. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the pension fund team that we met uh, were pretty dynamic um, and uh, were very keen um, to ensure that investment uh, in the local infrastructure took place while sticking to their fiduciary duties. Um, but in taking evidence from certain folks from pension funds here, it seems that they are rather more risk-averse in actually uh, making those investments. You talked about removing any barriers, and I think that's welcome. But how do we deal with the risk averseness that seems to be there amongst many of the pension fund managers here in Scotland? This issue comes down to an assessment of uh, the exercise of the, fidu the fiduciary duty. I'm going to struggle with that word all morning, I fear. Uh, the fiduciary duty of uh, pension scheme managers um, in exercising their responsibilities, convener, because ultimately um, these are um, pension fund assets being invested on behalf of um, uh, pensioners within the schemes, pension scheme members, and they must be able to deliver satisfactory returns. And I think the, the, the question that um, has to be addressed is whether um, the necessary and acceptable returns can be delivered um, within the approach to supporting infrastructure investment projects, which is at the heart of, of your, your question, convener. I certainly think that um, there is a need for fund managers to become much more engaged in the opportunities for long-term strategic investment in infrastructure than has been the case to date. Uh, and I think the Falkirk example is a very good one of how uh, scheme managers have begun that process. Um, so there is a, 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 my invitation to the Scheme Advisory Board to consider this issue and to advise me of any particular obstacles that they believe are there is essentially the, the, the design of the process that will enable uh, scheme managers to take the type of proactive uh, stance that uh, <coughs> that you have highlighted, convener. The one final point I would say about choice of investments is this. The, the, the whole there are limit, there are parameters and limits to the choice of investments that should be undertaken by scheme managers. Um, the questions around the ethics of investments are very important, and I think there are substantive ethical questions raised about some of the investments that may be made by fund managers, um, which will directly contradict the fiduciary duties of scheme managers, because you know, one investment um, might deliver a, a greater return, but the ethics of that investment may be unacceptable to the, uh, to, to, to the scheme in question. And that, to me, is a legitimate parameter to be applied on the exercise of fiduciary duties to ensure that the, uh, the ethical choices that are made about investments are fully and completely respected by the actions of pension fund managers. In terms of those parameters, um, we talked to... Uh, someone from Strathclyde Pension Fund the other week who didn't seem to have a difficulty in that um, uh, pension fund uh, investing in arms companies, for example, which is maybe one of these areas uh, where maybe pension funds should not. Um, and, you know, the excuse that's often given there um, is that in order to obtain uh, the, the best uh, bang for their buck, uh, to conform to their fiduciary duties, that they have no option but to invest in arms or tobacco or alcohol. Do you think that they have the ability um, to disinvest from these kind of areas? Yeah, I think that option exists for um, the, the, the pension 
policy priorities to be set and the investment priorities to be set by um, uh, those responsible for pension schemes which can set appropriate parameters um, which are um, entirely consistent with the fiduciary duty but which respect the ethical choices made by those charged with exercising responsibility for those particular pension funds. Um, we've seen some changes from the UK government to pension rules. What impact will that have in local government in Scotland? In which particular respect? Um, there, there have been some changes, I understand, to UK pension rules which may impact um, costs um, and may have a, a major impact on local government pensions. And I just wonder if, if you've got any comment on that. Well, well the, refor the reforms of the local government pension scheme are consistent with the legislation passed by the United Kingdom Parliament in relation to um, pensions reform follow following the uh, the Hutton Review. Um, so the, 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 we, we, we've gone through a, a successful process of renegotiation of the pension scheme, which I think was done in a... It was done in a, a commendable fashion by all interested parties uh, to ensure that the local government pension scheme complied with the legislation passed by the United Kingdom Parliament. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Deputy First Minister. Just on the issue of ethical choices, I, I know that there is, has some, been some concern raised about some of the investments that have taken place, not only in the local government pension uh, portfolio, but also in other pension portfolios in the public sector. Could you give us any indication whether the advisory board, uh, under your guidance, would be uh, given any indication what would be seen as ethical investments in the future? Well, these, the, 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 this, this, the scheme advisory boards um, have, and the, the scheme managers have a responsibility to um, formulate the policy decisions that they consider to be appropriate. The government does not direct these choices, and I think it would be, you know, I think there'd be a, a lot of issues raised about the government exercising that power of direction. And um, the, uh, so the, the, the choice is essentially up to um, the, uh, the, the, the fund managers to, um, uh, under guidance from scheme boards, uh, to make the appropriate choices consistent with the policy directions arrived at by these boards. Um, the, 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 the role of government is not to direct uh, these points. I think there would be, um, you know, we don't run the local government pension scheme. It would be inappropriate for ministers to be involved in directing those questions. Uh, and the point I made to convene in my earlier answer was the fact that I think it's entirely legitimate for these issues to be, um, for there to be, for these issues to be considered by scheme boards and for decisions to be taken accordingly uh, with uh, the, set the parameters within which fund managers operate as a consequence. Could you, Deputy First Minister, just outline what the role of the Scottish Government would be in guiding or advising the Scottish Public Pensions Agency and the board? Because what we've got, we've got a note provided for us for today's meeting, and as part of that note, it actually indicates uh, the, the draft work plan for the Scheme Advisory Board had been drawn up uh, and the draft was shared, and the, I'm quoting from the document and how accurate this is, you can correct or otherwise. This draft was shared with the Scottish Ministers for their approval. So... If, ah, but that's, that, 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 yes, but that's not about that's not right. about guidance on ethical investment. Right. That's about that's about operational matters and the the work plan of what the scheme advisory boards are are actually doing at uh, what I would describe as routine operational pensions um, management issues um, uh, and procedural questions, but not on questions of that nature. Right, thank you, Deputy First Minister, for that clarification, because I think it's useful to get that on the record, so there's no confusion in relation to. Uh, the role of the government in terms of the advisory board. But going back to the ethical investments, the, what we did here when we were, the committee visited Manchester is that some of the fund managers uh, felt they were in, had responsibility for the administration of those funds and they felt that they had to have autonomy in making decisions regarding the investments, particularly around the investment returns. Uh, because we heard uh, that some of these pension fund managers 
we had set targets of 11% returns on their investments, and they felt that those, invest those level of returns could only be matched by investing in what could be seen as some of the least ethical investment processes, and that some of the returns from the public uh, building program that we would like to see pension funds investing in would not give that level of return. And therefore, the investments they were claiming to be carrying out were in the best interest of the fund, not in the best interest of the wider population and the best interest of the public sector as a whole. Well, I think this comes back to the, the, one of the points I made in my, uh, my opening remarks, that there is a balance to be struck um, between encouraging this type of infrastructure investment and securing the necessary fiduciary duty of um, uh, of scheme managers. So it's perfectly permissible for um, scheme managers to um, be directed by the relevant boards to secure a, a particular level of return. Um, th there's not an, you know, there is a, a necessity to make sure that return is sufficient to ensure that the local government pension schemes can provide the necessary financial return for their members. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that through all of this, there are local government pensioners who require to get a return on the investments that they have made. Um, and there may well be a satisfactory return that can be achieved within that process by investing in, let me say, an infrastructure project. It doesn't have to be. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be the very best return that could be could be delivered because that could be by investing in some vehicle that um, was deemed to be inappropriate. So there are always choices in there. But I think we, in making an exercise in those choices, I don't think any of the scheme managers or boards can do so without paying due regard to the need to deliver on their fiduciary duty. But the fiduciary duty is not an absolute requirement. It can be a relative requirement. You know, a return of, um, you know, of one level may be perfectly acceptable for a fund. It doesn't have to be the very highest return, because securing the very highest return could involve you in securing investments that uh, are judged and deemed to be inappropriate. Thank you. Okay. Claire Adamson, please. Um, uh, good morning, uh, Deputy First Minister. I'd like to ask you about some of the um, the pressures that you, you might see coming um, um, to local councils uh, in the future. I'm thinking um, particularly of the, the change in the pension rules um, by the UK government, which COSLA have estimated might be a cost of £125 million, and whether there has been any progress in negotiating with the UK government about possible compensation that they've talked about doing for um, English and Welsh local authorities that are going to be particularly affected by this change. I'm in a slightly disadvantaged position in that we're having this conversation in advance of the outcome of the spending review uh, on the 25th of November, where um, essentially any question of that nature would be resolved. You know, I, I'm, I'm not in possession of what are the budget numbers uh, prospectively beyond um, those for the current financial year, and we'll get those um, as a consequence of the announcement of the spending review on the 25th of November. What I can say is that um, my expectation is that um, the changes that Claire Adelsman has re referred to um, will be um, significant factors with which we will have to wrestle. And we'll be wrestling with them right across the public sector within Scotland because these decisions that have been taken on um, employers' national insurance contributions and on pension contributions will have to be met by employers. Um, so uh, and there are other factors as well. You know, the apprenticeship levy, for example, we don't know quite, well, we don't know really any detail other than the fact there's going to be an apprenticeship levy and that's going to be applied to large, well, what's been described as large employers, although we can't get a definition of what a large employer is. 
So there are a range of factors that I can identify as being as having an effect on the the strength of public sector budgets. What I can't do today is quantify what effect I think those will be because of the, um, the, the, the fact that I don't have a final position from the UK government on what the financial settlement will look like beyond 2015-16. Um, okay. uh, just a final question on... Um, uh, some councils have yet to completely um, settle on, on equal pay and on job evaluation situations. Um, does that cause you some concern going forward because of the, there's this unknown liability there for some of the councils in Scotland? It, it causes me concern for two reasons. Uh, y yes, because of the unknown liability, although I suspect the liability is pretty well understood by all concerned. My greater concern is about the members of the public who are not having the settlement to which they are entitled. And, you know, I've been appearing before this committee for eight and a half years as a minister, and I suspect the first committee that I appeared before asked me about urgency, about equal pay, and I suspect I said at that time, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't suspect I said at the time, I said at the time, um, I think this is an issue that should be resolved speedily by local government. There's not really much... Um, New, well, there's no new ground being covered about this. It's all pretty well established over the last number of years. But it is a matter for individual local authorities to resolve. And I did see some media coverage this morning, which I think Fife Council has made um, some significant progress in this question, which, of course, I welcome. Thank you. Um, obviously, uh, Mr Swinney, we're here to scrutinise the budget, but that's been a little bit difficult considering uh, the lateness of the autumn statement. Um, and obviously um, that causes you difficulty in the fact that in terms of some of the questioning you're going to be unable to answer because uh, Mr Osborne uh, has not made the announcements that uh, we were expecting. Um, does, does the lateness of the autumn statement actually cause you a huge amount of grief and will that grief um, actually be felt by local government as well uh, who of course won't know what... Uh, what the settlement will be for them until much later as well. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's never any grief caused to me. I just glide past it all. I'm uh, collected. Yeah. Um, the, obviously, the, t the timing is not ideal, and I wouldn't, for, I wouldn't uh, begin to suggest that it's anything uh, 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 other than inconvenient. Um, we've, you know, we've had spending reviews before in. October. No, normally, I would have presented a budget to Parliament by September the 20th. That's the, my agreement with the Finance Committee is a uh, revolves around that date. And we've had previous spending reviews, which have been in October. I think, if my memory serves me right, we had one in November as well, in earlier November. I think you know, this is the very latest we've had in, in certainly my tenure in office. So it is much later. What um, I am hoping to do is to. Um, is to make as swift progress as I possibly can do in settling the government's budget and in making that clear to uh, uh, to Parliament uh, and to making the local government finance implications clear to local authorities as quickly as I possibly can do uh, after the spending review has been announced. Thank you. Uh, Mr Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just on that, Deputy First Minister, we, we are hearing a spate of announcements by local authorities throughout Scotland in terms of the budget savings that they've got to make. Uh, you know, a number of and authorities have indicated that you know, one authority in central Scotland uh, has indicated that something like 1,100 workers or employees will have to go as part of the budget uh, cuts. How can local authorities at the present moment give that uh, indication that there will be redundancies or uh, people uh, leaving the local government if we don't know what the budget settlement is going to look like until later in the year? Well, they can only be doing it by making a range of assumptions uh, about the budget, which uh, you have not been informed by uh, by decisions that I've taken. So uh, I think the uh, that that's the only way that uh, local authorities can be making predictions of these uh, of this nature. Now, you know, I've been around long enough, uh, and I've heard various rounds of all of these over the last few years, and uh, I'm, you know, I, I simply offer that as some 
context for the committee to consider that uh, I've heard many of these um, sort of doom-laden predictions um, which have not materialised. And um, I, as, as the convener said at the outset, um, we've worked very hard in Scotland to try to protect local authority finances in very challenging financial circumstances. I think that has been acknowledged by local government. It's certainly acknowledged by local government in England that there's been a very different settlement here compared to south of the border. Um, but I think the, the, the basis of the, uh, the numbers that have been put out there into the public domain by individual local authorities have been, can only be on the basis of a range of assumptions that they themselves have arrived at. Or based on their own understanding of the financial commitments they entered into a decade ago? Well, uh, these will be factors that will be relevant and the PFI burden will be a particular strain on local authorities that have, um, uh, that have committed to that, uh, uh, to that approach. Thank you very much. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we uh, went to Manchester um, and have been to Inverclyde and taken evidence on um, city deals. Um, I was at the, the launch of the Aberdeen City Deal bid in Parliament last night. Can I ask um, if the Scottish Government is uh, supportive of the UK's City Deal uh, programme and do you think that they offer value for money? Um, we are supportive and um, I was... Uh, well, you were at the Aberdeen City Deal launch in, in, in Edinburgh last night because I was in Aberdeen uh, with a business audience discussing this very question uh, last night uh, into the bargain. And I, I would say that the, there is a general enthusiasm for the exercise of city deals. Um, I think there's a particular opportunity in city deals to um, provide um, some of the integrated focus that would be beneficial in setting a clear agenda and direction for development in particular localities. Uh, and to see those um, those those issues within a much wider context. Um, if I just look at the, well, just to take the examples in your, in your own locality, uh, convener, um, there is such an inextricable link of interest between the um, the needs of Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire in terms of economic development. That to look at them. Um, separately or to look at them um, without looking at the wider context would be to miss an essential requirement about the necessary linked focus that is required. So yes, I, I, I do think um, that there are many strengths in the opportunities that come from city deals. I would say, however, that um, they need to be um, genuinely arrived at by... Um, collaborative working between the local authorities concerned, the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government, and crucially with the stakeholders and localities, whether that's the business community or community organisations or the wider stakeholder community. Um, if they're arrived at, out with that collaborative environment and infrastructure, then I don't think they will be as effective as they could be. Um, so I think the necessity to make sure that we operate within that collaborative environment is a crucial question in relation to um, to their success. Finally, convener, you asked me about value for money, and um, I think the, the the assessment of value for money um, must be applied rigorously and continuously through the city deal. The city deal of itself cannot be. I couldn't say to you today, every city deal is going to be value for money. That would that would be an in-principle commitment for which I would not have the evidence. But the value for money test must be applied on uh, all of the developments that are implicit in city deals and the steps that are taken. And my in-principle view is that they are likely to be value for money because they will be driven by the values of collaboration and cooperation, shared interest and the breaking down of boundaries between public authorities, which generally, in my view of public policy, are good things in relation to the exercise of um, policy decision-making and therefore in pursuing 
uh, a value for money assessment as a consequence. Thank you. In terms of that collaboration, we uh, certainly seen last night uh, the business community buying into the Aberdeen City and Shire bid. Um, do you think that other public sector partners uh, need to be involved uh, in the formulation and shaping uh, of any bids to ensure that it's successful? Yes. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, when we were in Manchester, we saw the effectiveness of Greater Manchester City deal um, because they all worked together collaboratively. And I was going to ask you what your involvement in the governance and management of a city deal should be. If you think, you know, how is the Scottish government planning to, how it's planning to, you know, I won't say interfere, but how it's going to be communicated? Um, well, certainly we would be, um, we, we would want to be. Um, closely involved in the setting of the direction of the city deal um, we would obviously in, in the city deal arrangement that um, has uh, been approved so far in relation to Glasgow we are funders within that and we have a funding commitment so in terms of that funding I have a duty of um, value for money to Parliament in relation to that investment that is undertaken, uh, and I have to be satisfied about that. So, so the government will want to be um, a closely involved in the direction of the city deals. I think the overriding question is, is perhaps the point that Mr. Buchanan made in his question to me, which is that the, the success of these ventures will be driven more by the collaboration amongst the interested parties than by the degree of government direction and. Uh, and intervention in the process. So the creation of a shared agenda amongst those parties, which is viewed by the government to be credible, acceptable, value for money, delivering on the purpose of the city deal, uh, that, that, that's the, that's, that would be the model of governance that I would see as being relevant in this process. Thank you. Are you intending, to, uh, is it your idea that you would fund all the city deals? I mean, or that, I mean they should all be funded by, by the government or a part by the Scottish Government? That, that, what you that, said. That, 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 invite, that invites me on a Wednesday morning to make a spending commitment in front of the Local Government Regeneration <laughs> Committee. And I think Mr Buchanan knows me well enough to know <laughs> that that's not, uh, it's not, it's not, a, general, it's not a general habit of mine uh, <laughs> to, to behave in such a fashion. Uh, we are... Yeah, we are, we, we're, we're very supportive, we're, we're keen to be helpful, um, but our degree of support and the level of support will be determined by the quality of the propositions that come forward. And, uh, sorry, and, and the direction of these city deals, do you think these city deals are really necessary? I mean, wh why are they necessary particularly? It's a rather more general question there. I think, the, I, think, uh, I think there is a benefit in them, because if I take the, if I take the example of... Um, um, since we've been talking about the North East, about Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire, um, we, we are jointly with the local authorities funding the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, which is a delight to say is now uh, taking its course around the city um, at long last. Um, that, and the convener will correct me on the geography, but the overwhelming majority of that route is in Aberdeen Shire area but it will have a profound effect on both Aberdeen Shire and Aberdeen City, um, both in terms of um, implications on the traffic system, but also in terms of the opening up of opportunity. So to, to, we need to then have a mechanism to essentially focus on that joint agenda, and I think the City Deal gives us that opportunity to do so. Um, it also, I think the City Deal... The City Deal has the potential to recognise some of the changes that have taken place in our society in recent years where cities have become ever more fundamental to the operation and the exercise of uh, an economic agenda. So the, the drive of cities like Aberdeen or Edinburgh or Dundee or Glasgow uh, uh, or Perth or Stirling or Inverness are now much more central to economic development in these in, 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 in our localities. So I think the city deals essentially recognise that need for us to be much more focused in our policy making at, at that level. Having said that, it is also important 
that we have sufficient policy interventions to support the development of um, the larger towns of Scotland, because the larger towns of Scotland face many, many challenges uh, around the country, and we cannot view, we can't put all of our eggs into the city deal basket. We have got to have policy interventions that properly and effectively deal with the requirements and the needs of some of the larger towns in Scotland that face acute challenges at this time. Thank you. Can I just have one uh, Finally, Cameron, yeah. final question? Just say, the, we saw how effective in Manchester the city deals were because it was Greater Manchester, i.e. the surrounding the periphery. Um, and you did mention there that you thought that the, um, the, the, the surrounding areas of Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow are important. Is it not getting more important, these surrounding areas, as they gather more and more areas, you know, as they get wider and wider? Um, I think the, the you're looking at the um, if you take the, the 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 city deal that's been talked around around about Edinburgh, uh, it's a it's a really quite a wide geography. Um, it's east, mid, west Lothian, the city, and also Fife. And from what I can deduce, um, and there's members representing. Um, the, the wider Fife area around the table who can contradict me if I'm getting this wrong but what I pick up is um, a very beneficial sense that those discussions are providing meaningful value for the localities out with the city of Edinburgh and that that's been welcomed by the localities out with the city of Edinburgh and um, I think that's the that is one of the key characteristics of the success, the potential success of city deals, is whether or not the the, the, the outlying localities actually feel there is some benefit uh, and advantage of being part. And of course, when we look at some of the wider questions around connectivity, these are crucial questions in relation to at the heart of the city deals that will relate to the involvement and the impact on some of the outlying areas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire Adamson, please. I, th I think you possibly partially answered my question already, um, Deputy First Minister. Obviously, I represent um, Central Scotland, so seven of the nine constituencies there are linked into the Glasgow and Clyde Valley city deal. Um, but I do have a concern that there may be pockets of areas, like Falkirk Council, um, which of course includes the Grange area, which mm -hmm. is hugely important to um, Scotland's economic um, future. Um, uh, do you have a concern that we might end up with pockets of, of considerable um, importance to Scotland that aren't linked into these deals? Well, we have to. We have to. We, we have to be mindful of that. And, and I think the, the um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely reasonable point that's that's been raised, and one that we have to be very careful about. Um, and in, in terms of the city, the city deal areas. Um, you know, Glasgow and Clyde Valley and the, uh, the the City of Edinburgh deal are covering really quite wide geographies, um, and that's welcome. But if I then think about, well, I suppose actually, if I if I if I have got all of my geography correct, Falkirk is probably the bit in the that is out of out of both. Um, but I would say that if you look at some of the other interventions that we've made on Tax incremental finance, for example, Falkirk, well, the, the, the Greensmouth area, particularly within Falkirk Council area, is a very good example of an imaginative project that's come forward that's been supported by the government. So city deals are not the only um, uh, tool in the box. Um, we have tax incremental finance, which has been, well, as Claire Adams and I discussed in parliamentary questions um just a few weeks ago, the Raven, you know, the Ravenscake um, tax incremental finance pilot is 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 now being reconsidered by the interested parties because the original propositions are not fall, forming in the way that was originally envisaged. And you know, I, I I think that's you know these things will happen, and we just have to be open to trying to pragmatically and supportively address these questions. Uh, the, 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 so so there will be a range of interventions like that. We have the growth accelerator model in the city of Edinburgh, which is designed to try to help fund 
the redevelopment of the St James's Quarter, St James's Centre, and a very significant strategic de development in the east end of the city. So there will be a range of different um, interventions that will be deployed to try to support individual localities. And how I would reassure the committee about how we're approaching that is, is through some of our thinking around inclusive growth, where we are determined to try to ensure that we have um, a, a much more effective way of tackling regional inequity, which you know has been a fact of life in Scotland for many years, but is becoming a more acute fact of life in some localities in Scotland, and we have to particularly address those factors and the interventions that we make. Thank you. Okay. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Deputy First Minister, there has been alleged that some of the bids for the City Deal funding are effectively old off-the-shelf projects. Uh, what would be your response to that? Um, well, they, they, they're, they're not exactly innovative or strategic in their outlook. They're basically just... Uh, projects that have been lying around for a number of years that local authorities have decided to pull off the shelf and throw into the city deal pot in the hope they get funding for it. Mm -hmm. Well, they would have to be um, uh, they would have to pr be projects that would provide um, um, enhancement to the economic infrastructure and the competitiveness of localities for them to be able to, 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 to be advanced as part of the city deals. And as part of my point, my answer to Mr Buchanan's question earlier on, where um, the government doesn't want to micromanage the city deals, but we do want to be assured that, they've, that they are emphatic, that they've got, that there is good thinking behind them, that there is um, a strong assessment of value for money uh, at, at, at their heart. Um, so there will be assurance mechanisms within the arrangements and city deals that provide us with confidence that the decisions that have been taken are decisions around projects that will deliver enhanced value for that locality and, as a consequence, uh, benefit for the Scottish economy into the bargain. Taking on board that, Deputy First Minister, and the value for money and in a time of tight financial constraints for local authorities and how they use that uh, available money uh, to invest, it's interesting that I won't go into detail of particular project, but one of the city deal bids that I'm aware of is actually a bid that's come from a local authority where there's a private sector commitment to deliver infrastructure as part of a development <laughs> that has actually now been submitted as part of the council's city deal bid. Uh, and while you're correct, you wouldn't want to micromanage that, but surely we should be looking at best value and we should be ensuring that we are not taking any responsibility away from the private sector and their investment programme, particularly when it comes to infrastructure, uh, to basically for that infrastructure to be paid for by the public purse. Um, without knowing the, the specific circumstances that Mr Wilson is, is referring to, uh, I, I would just say that I would think it would be a kind of odd decision for a local authority to, if they've got a financial commitment from the private sector to pay for a piece of infrastructure, to say, no, no, don't you pay for it, we'll pay for it. I just find that that would just be a bit odd, and certainly would contradict everything that local authorities tell me about uh, the challenges they face about public finance. But uh, certainly not a decision I would take. I will pass the details on to you. Please do. Yeah, look at okay, Jane Baxter, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, I listen with interest to your comments about um, city deals offering value for money, and I'm a big believer in collaboration and, and shared agenda, so I'm very pleased to, to to note your comments on that. But it seems to me that there's, there are two complementary agendas, agendas going forward at the same time. One is the community empowerment agenda, and the other is the planning review, which I know is in its very early, early stages. Do you think these other agendas will, will help city deals to, to give powers to, to communities? Do you think that there are links across the three agendas, or, or are they separate? Um, I think they're all. I think they're all part of the same uh, nature of policy, which is about, or the same area of policy, which is about um, greater local discretion. 
uh, it just happens to be in different forms. So the community empowerment agenda has got a relevance to absolutely every community in the land and that will manifest itself in different ways in different parts of the country. So you will have certain community certainly communities that wish to do certain things. The community empowerment agenda is, is proving very beneficial in parts of rural Scotland in relation to um, land ownership. In some parts of urban Scotland, community empowerment is bringing forward um, a real appetite on the part of communities to take over facilities that um, have you know, become redundant in their current form, but communities have got uh, sufficient uh, views about how they might be developed and taken forward and can make more of a success of them under their ownership and, and uh, there are countless examples of these around the country so there's a I think there's a uh, I suppose the the policy framework the consistency of the policy framework is that the emphasis is placed onto localities to take the initiative whether that's at a village level through perhaps more ideally through community empowerment or a city level through a city deal where a city a city region is taking more initiative for development in their locality you could argue the same test is being achieved by the village taking greater responsibility for the village hall through the community empowerment agenda mm -hmm. uh, thanks Kevin. Uh, where do you think the ultimate accountability and responsibility will sit then for these decisions being um effective for, for those communities, where do you see that sitting? Does it sit at the, the community council or the council or the city deal partnership? How will they it'll, it'll, agree? It will sit at different levels. Um, it, you know, I think if I take my exa if I take my two examples there um, of a city deal or a village hall acquisition by a community organisation. Ultimately, the, 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 the acquisition of the village hall and its operation by a, a community organisation, the accountability will be to the locality and to the members of the public by whatever device. You know, I'm a member of a number of um, community organisations in my constituency who run village halls and village facilities and all the rest of it. And um, their accountability is to those who use the facilities and to their locality. On the city deal, the accountability will be to the members of the the, com the component authorities, but then also to the Scottish and United Kingdom governments if we are funders of those propositions, and that will be done through a governance structure, which governance structure, which will be some form of governance board um, that w that will exercise that responsibility. Okay, thank you. Thanks, convener. Yeah. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Thanks, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I just return to the, the city deal issue in, in relation to the regional inequity that you mentioned, or my, some of my colleagues have mentioned that potential concern, and I would have that too, representing Kilmarnock and Northern Valley, which is the last time I looked, there aren't any cities in that <laughs> particular region. Firstly, what's the criteria that, that would enable an area, a region, to, to participate in the city deal process? And how, how, might it, how might the impact on an area like Kilmarnock and Northern Valley be, be assessed if, for example, the Glasgow and Clyde Valley city deal were, was able to, to set a new course of direction for economic development that might have an impact on us? So how could, how could we influence that or be protected from something that might not be uh, in our interests in that part of Ayrshire? I think what we, what we have to do here, and, and, and this, is, this is why I answered the, 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 the very first question on this series of questions from members by, by, by setting out the government's firm commitment to city deals but also to recognising that there are other localities in Scotland that require to be um, assisted and supported in a focused way. So um, we, whilst we, we may support a city deal um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, well, most expressly it does not mean that we are then closed for other ways in which we can support developments in individual localities. Um, so we, 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 as we look at our agenda on tackling regional inequity, we will have particular areas of the country where we think there are particular challenges that have to be overcome. Um, that may not be touched by a city deal proposition and which we've got to find other mechanisms to support in that way. And um, the, the points I'm, you know, I've stressed a number of different areas where, uh, or a number of different initiatives that the government takes to try to 
support that agenda um, and um, there will be uh, ways in which we can engage with localities on uh, on those points. Um, you know, the three Ayrshire councils, for example, are, are discussing collaboration around a growth proposition in Ayrshire, and we'd be very interested in that. And you know, the Ayrshire economy is an economy as part of Scotland that causes me some significant concerns. I think Mr. Coffey and I have discussed some of these questions on previous occasions, and um, so. A proposition like that is an interesting proposition for the government to look at because, again, it's got all of the attributes of the city deal at heart, which are collaboration between different public authorities, the creation of a shared agenda with the objective of delivering some dynamic growth as a consequence. So, um, in a sense, what I would say is that um, our agenda is not restricted to city deals, um, our objective is to make sure that all parts of Scotland have the opportunity to flourish um, through the government's agenda. Mm -hmm. the, the, the UK government talks about growth deals. Is that, is, that, is that what you mean by this? You don't have to be a city to be a part of this process. If, uh, for example, in Ayrshire, you mentioned perhaps the towns of Comarna, Ayr and Irvine, being the core principal towns in that, that area, could propose some kind of... Um, direction for economic growth in, 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 in Ayrshire, that, that would be sufficient, is that what you're saying, yes, uh, to, to qualify in terms of a growth deal in, in a sense? That well, we, we, you know, for the, the proposition that the Ayrshire councils are looking at is, you know, the, the, the councils are engaging with the Scottish Government and our officials are in regular uh, discussion with um, the councils about these points. Um, we have in, in Ayrshire, I know, I know it's not relevant to Mr Coffey's constituency, but um, some of our decisions on enterprise area status has given particular opportunities to areas of Ayrshire. So that's another of the, 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 the tools in the box that we deploy to try to support economic development in individual localities. But um, the emergence of an agenda from the three Ayrshire councils that would could be a, a combined and cohesive agenda which um, supports an agenda of growth would be what well, we are engaging with it already and we'd be happy to continue to do so. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the delay to the autumn statement, I uh, would imagine that that causes you some difficulty in terms of the discussions that you would normally have with COSLA at this time uh, about budget allocations. Um, can you assure the committee that, as per usual, uh, COSLA will be consulted uh, on the budget as it becomes more apparent? It, well, it, it's, th 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 those discussions have been underway for some time and um, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice and I have had a number of meetings with um, COSLA on the issues around the spending review. Uh, the local government are our partners, um, so we, we need to understand the issues and the challenges that they face and to try to work um, as collaboratively and cooperatively as we can to address those issues. We, um, one of the elements of the approach to the spending review is that we are looking at um, not just in terms of the traditional portfolio allocations that get made, but we are looking at some of the themes that um, capture some of the broader areas of public expenditure. So, for example, um, employability is a theme a focus of government expenditure, but it's not contained in one neat little compartment within a portfolio budget. It's spread across a range. Innovation <coughs> innovation is another. The learning journey is a third. Health and social care integration is a fourth. Um, the justice agenda is, is a fifth. Um, and in all of these areas, we are having substantive discussions with local government about how we proceed on these questions so that local government have the opportunity to be fully part of the developing thinking within the government on the spending review, um, given the fact that local government will be, in all of those five examples that I cited there of employability, innovation, health and social care, justice, and the learning, the, the learning journey, they're all areas where local government are central partners. So we, um, we are having those discussions um, frequently with local government as part of developing our thinking on these questions. Um, so a, a further breaking down of the silos then when it comes to yes, yes. and more innovative thought in terms of budget allocation. And then and what 
obviously, once the numbers are clear um, on the 25th of November, there is then a, you know, a much more sharply focused discussion around what do the numbers look like and what do they, uh, what do they mean and what how are they allocated? But um, the, uh, the 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 wider um, the wider questions that I've cited there are examples of how we are trying to um, create greater cohesion in the way in which we use public expenditure, and as a consequence, to maximise its effectiveness. Greater cohesion and possibly less duplication. Uh, well. <laughs> Uh, duplication is the enemy, uh, so we, uh, and obviously when money is tighter, which it's going to be tighter, uh, part of my focus is to remove duplication from the way in which public expenditure is deployed. And, and, and that, uh, you know, that, uh, that may mean uh, changes in the way in which we undertake particular approaches, um, but what I'm trying to do is to avoid duplication and maximise the maintenance of outcomes for members of the public within Scotland um, where money becomes ever more difficult to secure. Thank you. Um, could you maybe update us, uh, update the committee on the progress that's been made by the Commission on Local Tax Reform and when it's likely to report? The Commission is um, pursuing its work programme. Um, it is doing that um, to timescale. And we expect the Commission to report before the end of November. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you for giving us the time today? Um, and I now suspend uh, the meeting and we move into private session. Thank you.